Before I begin, let us pray. Lord, we thank you that we can still open the Bible together, that we can still hear from your word, hear from your truth. And we pray, Lord, that as we attempt to do so today, that you will work powerfully, that you will speak clearly through me, for it's only through your spirit that anything good comes out of this time. So may that happen. May your spirit move and shape, prompt and encourage, challenge and possibly rebuke. Lord, be with us at this time, we ask. In your name, Amen. We have a weird relationship with rules. It's interesting, in the current crisis, as responding uh, to the social distancing rules, um, we struggle with this. There's already protests about how they want to reopen the economy already. Uh, and I saw an article uh, that had 16 reasons that you're allowed to be outside of your house. And in one facet, that is good. Like, this is good information of what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. But I'm sure for some people, uh, it is more like an arsenal of excuses to give to law enforcement. Like, yes, officer, it looks like I'm going out to eat pizza and watch Netflix with my friends, but I'm not doing that because that would be illegal. No, I'm going shopping. No, I'm going to donate blood. No, I'm going to move. Uh, there's boxes in the boot we don't need to check. We have a weird relationship with rules. We need them, and we know we need them, but when we have them, then we look for loopholes for them. Um, as a youth pastor, I would often get youth kids asking me, tell me, Michael, tell me black and white, what can I watch and what can I not watch? What does the Bible say about watching Tiger King? I need to know these things. We as a society, particularly with uh, our Aussie convict roots, have a weird relationship with rules. And in this passage, Jesus kind of redefines those rules. He's kind of saying in this, uh, in part one of the Sermon on the Plain, which is Luke's version of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, he's kind of saying, you think this is the way that you should live, but I'm telling you, this is the way that you should live. You think this is okay, but I'm actually telling you, no, 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 this is what we need to be striving for as Christians, as believers of Christ. That's kind of where we're heading today. Uh, the Sermon on the Plain is two parts. Today we're looking at the first part and the intro to it, which is the choosing of the twelve. Uh, with the Sermon on the Plain that we're looking at today, the two focuses will be the Beatitudes, uh, Luke's version of uh, the Beatitudes, which Matthew also does a version of in Matthew 5. And then we'll be focusing on uh, Jesus' understanding of love. The who, the how and the why. So that's where we're going. So, but we start our passage today with this introduction of Jesus picking the twelve. Um, the idea is that Jesus has gone from town to town and he's picked up followers uh, who have been with him and go with him as he travels. But now he's going to pick the twelve, the, the apostles. He has disciples and now he's going to make uh, twelve apostles in a technical sense. And these apostles will have a greater access to Jesus, his ministry, and his teaching. And these apostles are the one who will carry on his ministry into the church when he ascends to his Father in heaven after his death and resurrection. The apostles are extremely important. And before, uh, it's kind of like Jesus is deciding to use cheerleading terminology, uh, who's going to make that? Or like in high school, when you really wanted to be on the high school basketball team and you practice every afternoon after school, but your growth spurt just hadn't kicked in yet, and again, you don't get picked. I'm not bitter, I'm not bitter. Jesus is picking his elect, the 12 apostles, who will carry on his ministry after he leaves. And so in this, Jesus has a very big decision to make. And what he does before he makes that decision is he goes and he prays. Uh, verse 12. One of, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And this is worth pausing on. For Jesus has a big decision to make, and before he makes that decision, he prays. He spends a large chunk of time, in this passage, the whole entire night, 
of seeking God's face, of seeking his Father's will, of spending time in prayer and devotion to him before he makes the decision. It's like Jesus in this time is going, Lord, help me decide. Show me who I should be choosing. You know everything. You know how this is going to pan out. Help me do this, Lord. And isn't that a good little mini application for us as well? That before we face a big decision in our lives, that we are also to pray. Before we choose whether to change jobs or careers, pray. Before we uh, ask someone out to date or even think about uh, proposing or uh, trying to figure out who to marry, that we pray. Before we decide what you need to go to or what course to study, that we would pray. Before we move, that we would pray. Before uh, we decide to have more kids, that we would pray. We're not thinking that. It's just an example. Before the big decisions in our life, that we would pray. And when I say pray, I'm not saying just shooting up a 10 second prayer in between us doing other things. No, I'm saying devoting a large chunk of time in solid devotion to God, seeking his face on the decision that we are about to make. For that is what Jesus does here. And then Jesus chooses his 12. Uh, verse 14. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Can you imagine reading this passage with no previous knowledge about the story of Jesus? And Luke just drops out, uh, Judas is going to be a traitor. It's like reading a murder mystery, and then halfway through it's like, um, just saying, the butler did it, but let's go back to our mystery. If Luke had done that now, he would have been trolled hard on Twitter. But we have the list of the apostles. And with this list, Simon is first, whom, and he is always first. And it's noted that he, Jesus has changed his name to Peter, so we can call him Peter from now on as well. And there's a couple of different things that we can note in relation to this, but I want to pull out just one. That is, in this list of 12, you have two particular people who are grouped together. First is Matthew, the tax collector, and second is Simon, the zealot. And in terms of uh, ancient Near East Jewish political schemers, they were an exact extreme opposites politically to each other. On the one hand, you have Simon the Zealot. Simon, who was the face of the Jews, face of what it meant to be a Jew, nationalistic and hard on the rights of Israel. Many in that camp would be uh, talking negatively about the Roman oppressors and how they need to rebuke and revolt from that. That was all about Israel, all about Jews. And then on the other hand, you have Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew, who was basically the face of the Roman Empire to the Jews. Matthew, who would have benefited financially and benefited, become wealthy as a result of his relationship with the Roman Empire. They were two politically diverse people. And yet they were unified under Christ. They had heaps of reasons to not like each other. Many reasons to never be in the same room as each other. But under Christ they become apostles, followers of Jesus together. They are unified by Christ. And isn't that a great example for us as well? Isn't that what we as the church need to be? That we as the church are uni united under Christ. And we can be different. We can be different politically. We can be different socioeconomically, different demographics, different ethnicities, different culture, different likes. You can be Marvel, you can be DC, it doesn't matter because we are united in Christ. We lay those other things down in order to serve Him, in order to do His ministry, in order to proclaim His gospel. We are united under Christ despite our previous differences. At a church that I used to go to, there was this guy called... Um, I won't name him, but he was a Christian rapper. Uh, and he and I are very, very different. Uh, I'm highly educated and he wasn't. Uh, he was charismatic and handsome and I am, well, let's move on. And he was a rapper. He had this musical ability that was just awesome and still is. He still performs. Um, and one of his songs even got to, on to Triple J. Well, my rapping ability kind of begins and ends at doing Ice Ice Baby at karaoke. And that did not end well. We were very, very different people. 
but because of Christ we became friends and we work together to proclaim his gospel and that is what it means to be church. Just like you have Simon and Matthew together, you, you can be different and unified in Christ to do his will. Okay, and so then we get to the Sermon on the Plain. Verse 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there. Verse 17, please, Elijah. And a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region, around Tyre and Sidon. So this is the Sermon on the Plain. And this is basically Luke's version of what Matthew calls uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And there's some big differences between the two. For example, with Luke's Sermon on the Plain, it is only uh, 39 verses, but Matthew's is three chapters long. 107 verses. And a lot of this uh, differs for the way the two books are structured. For Matthew, it's basically structured around five discourses, five sermons, uh, which he kind of rotates the book around. And here in the Sermon of Mount, Matthew kind of puts all of Jesus' ethical teaching in one place. Luke's structure, structure is a lot more of the smattering of Jesus did this and he preached this, and Jesus went here and he did that. And so with Luke, we have a lot of ethical teaching here in the Sermon on the Plain. But we also get other bits with Matthew, which Matthew includes in the Sermon on the Mount in different places in the Gospel of Luke. And so they're covering the same idea, but doing so in different ways. And that's why one of the reasons why it looks different. And then we start this with the Beatitudes. Now, again, worth noting, Luke gives us four Beatitudes, where Matthew gives us nine. Um, and Matthew, is, in his Beatitudes, is spiritually focused, where Luke is more practically driven. And so, when Matthew speaks about the poor, it is the poor in spirit. When Luke speaks about the poor, it's the actual poor. Uh, the poor of people who don't have any money. And so, we see this in verse 20 and 21. Sorry, Elijah. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And let's just pause and unpack that first. Um, for the blessed uh, kind of means uh, happy or uh, joyous, or to put more colloquially, how good is it? And that's what we're thinking when we see blessed. And then when I first read this, I was thinking, well, how is this the case? How are the poor, the hungry, and the mourning blessed? Like, actually. Like, they don't have any money, they don't have any food, they're in deep distress. And Jesus is saying that they are blessed. How does that work? See, we don't look at Christians in the third world and consider them blessed. We don't look at Christians living in the slums of the world and consider them blessed. We don't hear stories of Christians working hard, days, putting in physical labour for a dollar a day and consider that blessed. We don't consider that blessed. And yet that's what Christ is doing here. And the reason he can do that, the reason he can say that is because he's not looking at the now, he's looking at the then. And Jesus here is talking about the great eschatological reversal, the great end times reversal. Where even though for Christians, for many Christians, it is really hard now, and that is the goal. If you are having an easy life as a Christian, then you might not be doing it right. Though we have trials and tribulations and difficulties now, the then is so amazing. The then is uh, mind-blowing. The then is where we get our great reward. The then overwhelms and overpowers the now, and as a result, we are blessed. And we see that more and more as we go through this passage. Uh, then the last one for Luke, verse 22 and 23. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Sorry, Elijah. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. I kind of like how the message uh, puts this first part. 
Count yourself blessed every time someone cuts you down or throws you out. Every time someone smears or blackens your name to discredit me. Count yourself blessed when you are persecuted because of Jesus Christ. Uh, rejoice, leap for joy. The message puts it, a uh, spring like a lamb. And that's a little weird, isn't it? Because when you are persecuted, you don't feel blessed. Uh, growing up, I've talked about this in the past, growing up uh, in high school, I was a nerd, I was a geek. Um, and, and some of that was because I was just really sh short and really skinny and very uncoordinated. Um, and some of that was because of who I was, I was so, slightly socially awkward. <laughs> I'll say slightly, people who knew me back then, let's not go there. Um, and also, uh, I, was, I liked things that other people didn't like. For example, I liked comics before Robert Downey Jr. made comics cool. Um, I wasn't popular, but I was also a Christian. I was also a do-gooder, a goody two-shoes. And as a result, I was mocked, I was insulted, and uh, a lot of people didn't want to be my friend. I remember uh, people coming to me and, and talking about a party and like, oh, are you going to that? And then realising due to the blank look on my face that I didn't have, not have a clue of what they were talking about. And their voice would kind of trail off. Um, and when I did go to parties, I, I wouldn't drink or partake in the things that the other people did. I was, I was different, I stood out. I remember uh, I went to my year 10 formal after party. Uh, me and my went, mate, uh, my friend went, and well, all the other students were bringing uh, vodka and whiskey and beer. Me and my friend bought soft drink. I remember this specifically because my friend bought a, bought a, a bottle of Bart Simpson's Clear Cola. Looks like lemonade, tastes like cola. You can't forget that. As a result, if I was, for my faith, I was persecuted. And I didn't feel blessed. And growing up, I've lost friends because of my faith. Uh, I've been yelled at because of my faith. Uh, I've lost job opportunities, dating opportunities because of my faith. And I'm really happy with the way that worked out. I've lost because of my faith. And at the moment of that loss, I did not feel blessed. And yet Jesus is saying I'm blessed. And why, how can he say that? Because he, he is not looking at the now. He is looking at the then. For great is my reward because of what uh, I am going through now. Great is my reward because then it will be awesome. Great is my reward. And when Jesus says great, you know it's going to be great. Um, part of the reasoning of, of why we are blessed when persecuted is because that is how the an their ancestors treated the prophets. It's like Jesus is saying the prophets of old copped it too. Uh, the prophets were treated in the same way. The prophets, those who were proclaiming the message of God, were hated, uh, insulted, excluded, perceived, mocked as evil. Blessed are you because you are in good company. Blessed are you because you are just like them, uh, losing for your faith. Blessed are you. Uh, we then get the woes, uh, the flip side to the blessed. If we, next slide. Which are basically the opposite. Uh, these woes are the bizarre version of the blessed. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. In the Old Testament, when a prophet warns people of condemnation, they would often use the term woe. The woe refers to unrelenting pain, sorrow, and agony, the kind that cannot be relieved. Woe crushes a person. And to put it in modern vernacular, it like, it's like, sucks to be you who falls into this category. And the targets of the woe have no mention of Jesus in their life. The targets of the woe are those who are living for the now, those who are living it up, those who are living their best life possible now. And it is woe to them, for they receive their comfort in the here and now. They will not receive it in the then. For when judgment comes, they will be hungry. 
For when judgment comes, they will mourn and weep. For when judgment comes, it will not end well for them. Woe. It sucks to be them because of what is coming for them. There is a delayed sense of gratification here, a delayed or instant. Um, there is, uh, I'll tell the story of my kids. Um, Sam is very much into delayed gratification. Uh, if you give Sam a lollipop, that lollipop can literally last him a year. We have found lollies in his room that he was given in party bags from a year previously, and he's just he still has them, he still has those lollies. Whereas Josh, Josh finishes the party bag before we even arrive home from the party. <laughs> Josh does it, he's all about the instant, and then Sam is all about the delay. Uh, Sam, we have to um, kind of get him to stop being so responsible. And no, spend your money, Sam. <laughs> you gotta spend it, not just keep saving it. He had more money. We keep going when we need money for cash for the pizza guy. We write another IOU and put it in Sam's little bank account because he's got so much money there. Josh, we can't do that. <laughs> There's a difference between the delay and the instant. And when we are talking in the spiritual realm, we as Christians are in all about the delayed gratification. We don't get our gratification now. We get trials now. We get struggles now. We get difficulties now. Particularly if we are living like Christ has intended for us to live. But the then, but the then it will be worth it. As Christians, we don't live for the now. We live for the then. We lift our eyes up out of our current difficulties towards our great reward, which is in heaven. And I think this idea of looking forward to something to come is very relevant for us um, in the middle of lockdown. Uh, for we too are looking forward to that time where lockdown finishes, where we can go shopping for like clothes again, not just online. Uh, we, where we are able to go for a coffee with a friend and be in distance of less than a meter with them. When we're able to go to the gym and get rid of this post-quarantine pudge, um, when we're able to go to my favourite Thai place, which hopefully hasn't shut down in the midst of quarantine. When we get to go back to pubs. When we get to go back to uh, garage sales. Oh, garage sales. Do you remember that? Being able to use Gumtree and not having to wipe everything down with disinfectant. Those are going to be the days. So we're going we're gonna to handle this lockdown and the difficulties that that places because we know how awesome it will be then to minimise the effects for others. We as Christians live for the then and not for the thou. And then when we are living with these, these difficulties, we are to rejoice, not just grin and bear it, not just suck it up princess or suck it up dinosaur as it is in my and the Pippin household, but rather we rejoice and we leap for joy in the midst of our struggles because we don't live for the now. We live for the then. So in summary, in these Beatitudes, Jesus is saying, it's just like opposite day. A blessed to the poor, woe to the rich, because you already got yours. Blessed to those who hunger, woe to those who are well fed now, because you are going to go hungry. Blessed to those who weep, woe to those who laugh now, because you're getting away. Blessed to those who are persecuted, woe to those who don't receive persecution, and everyone is nice to you. Because just, that's just the false prophets, and it didn't end well for them either. This is the way of God's economy. God does not value the rich. God does not value the momentary laughter. God does not value those who have now. God values those who put Christ first now, and rejoice in the midst of that suffering, for great is their reward. It is opposite day in God's economy. Or, as the blackboard from Mr. Squiggle says, upside down, upside down. So then we continue. And the last section that we will look at in the Sermon on the Plain today is all about love. Now, love is a cheap word today and not well understood. Um, we are taught from movies and pop culture that, that love conquers all. That true love wins. But here, the great moral teacher, if he teaches us anything about love, it is that love hurts. Love is sacrificial. Love is difficult. And we, as followers of Christ, are to love those who do not love us. Verse 27. 
Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. The first thing that Jesus starts with in relation to love is the who. And Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And that can be a little bit weird for us because in modern cases, we don't have arch nemeses. Um, there is no Joker to our Batman, no Megatron to our Optimus Prime, no Dr. Claw to our Inspector Gadget. And we don't often think of people in those categories. But there are people we don't like. We try to love, but we don't like them. There are people who are difficult. And there are people, and I think the biggest category of the enemies that we need to be thinking of here is those who have hurt us. Those who have done us wrong in the past. They are who Jesus is talking about for us as Christians to love. To show love to. Those who have done us wrong. Or who have hurt those that we love. That is who Jesus is talking about here. But we should not just love when it is easy. Love the people who love you. Love the people who tell you you're awesome. Love your personal fanboys. Love those who are going to reciprocate in some way down the line. I mean, that's great. That's needed. We need to love each other in the church as well. We need to go above and beyond for each other. That is good things to do. But that love does not stop there. The Christ-like love doesn't end there. No, no, no. The Christ-like love, Christ -like love goes beyond that to those who are not like us, to those who have hurt us, to our enemies. For as Christ says in verse 32, If you love those who love you, what credit it is, is it for you? Even sinners love those who love them. Sorry, Elijah. Loving those who are like you, loving those who love you back, that's standard background noise. Not the melodious notes of the gospel, that is what is expected. Not unexpected. That's the norm. It's not an attention getter. It doesn't get attention and then points it to Christ. But loving your enemies, that stands out. Showing love in the face of mocking and insult, that stands out. People take notice about that. And that notice is then able to be channeled back to Jesus Christ, back to his gospel, back to his truth, that they may hear the truth about of him. We as Christians are to love those who don't love us. And when we do this, the world takes notice. But then love how? Love your enemies, but how are we going to do that? Well, just like above and beyond. The verbs used in these passages include, if you can go to the next slide, please, include love, bless, pray for. Turn the other cheek. Don't withhold your shirt. Don't demand it back. Lend. Do good. Do, do, do. Active uh, effort is required. If DC Talk told me anything, it is. Love is a verb. Love is not just about word. It also requires deeds. We must love and do stuff to those who hate us. Love makes demand. Love cannot be shown with words or thoughts alone. We must love in word and deed. People hate us, we do them good. People curse us, we bless them. People abuse us, we pray for them. Pray for them. Show kindness, generosity. Genuinely waving to those who are shooting us daggers. That is what it means to love. To love our enemies. Now, when talking about this, I must know that, note that there is a line here. Um, love is not always compliance. Love is not the absence of challenge. And we see that in John the Baptist. John the Baptist loved, but he continually um, commands repentance. John the Baptist loves people, but he rebukes them and tells them that they're wrong in doing the actions that they are. Passages like this have historically been used by some in the church to allow for um, continuing domestic abuse in relationships. Of putting oneself in danger unnecessarily while someone else's sin sprays all over the place and damages and hurts physically and verbally. That is not the intention of Jesus Christ here. And what's more is it's not love to go towards blind submission. It's not, in many ways, that is the opposite of love. 
It's not love to allow another person's sin to rage all over you unprotected. That is not love. To enable sin is not love. It's actually the easy part. Allowing no repercussions for their sin is not love. This passage should never uh, be used to put other people in danger, to allow those who are offending or abusing in any way to be able to continue to do that. But that is not the love that Jesus is talking about here. We need to call that out as a people, as an individual, but also as a church. This passage has been uh, misunderstood and much damage has occurred from it. And we shouldn't continue in that, in that path. But we still need to love those who don't love us. Love our enemies, lo love those who hate us, love, bless and pray in the face of the legitimate hurt. Now that means doesn't mean we'll always continue to put ourselves in their sphere, but we will still attempt in whatever way to love them. Um, I've been challenged by this passage in the past, and, and I attempt to do this in my own life. Uh, in my history, I have people who I have been, uh, in my perspective, uh, greatly hurt by, uh, done wrong by. And every once in a while, they will come to my mind, or I will um, see them in some situation. And when I do, I take a deep breath, I swallow my pride, I swallow my pain, and I try and pray for them. And it is not easy. And it's not something I want to do. But I try to put the pain down. And I pray that they will know God. I pray that spiritually they will grow in their relationship with God. I pray for their family that they too will know God. I pray for, in some cases, their ministry that they will continue to do great things for God. I pray for repentance. I pray that people will come into their life that will be able to rebuke them and that they will listen to them, that they don't reoffend in other similar scenarios. I pray for them. I pray that I will one day see them in heaven. And this isn't about how awesome is Michael. It's not at all. I didn't start there by any margin. Where I started was raw anger, clenched fists, thinking bad thoughts about them. But that's not where God wanted me to end. And so through his word, he challenged and convicted me on this very thing, that I would be able to get to the place, and I'm still not perfect, and I still don't do it enough, and I still harbour that pain and hold on to that in some ways, but I need to let it down in order that I may love them and show them Christ's love for them. Who is that for you? What does it look like for you to love your enemies? To bless, to pray, to do good for them. And you don't want to. And it hurts to do so. And yet that's the kind of love that Christ calls us as Christians to. What does it look like for you? We end this in why we would love. And the passage gives us a couple of ways. We see verse 31, uh, treat others how you want to be treated. Uh, for I know that there are people in my past uh, that I have hurt. And I would love it that despite the pain that I have caused them, that they would still pray for me and seek to show me love. So we, we do it for others because that's how we want to be treated. And we do it for others because in verse 35, the great is our reward in heaven. Because we live for the then and not for the now. We do it for others to prove that we are God's children and to be able to use that as an opportunity to point others to Him. But I think the last and greatest reason why we would love in this way is found in 1 John 4, 19. We love because He first loved us. We were that sinner that mocked and insulted Christ. We were that sinner that was far away from Him in our sin, and yet still Christ died for us. In the face of hatred, Christ loved me and chose to die for me. I want to and am challenged to and need to show that love to others because Christ did it for me. We love 
because he first loved us. May that be the kind of love that we show to those who have hurt us, to those who are different to us, to those that don't like us, that we would bless, we would pray, and that we would love. Living a Christian life is different than the world lives. Um, and we are blessed as a result. Not in the now, but in the then. So practically, how can we love? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for showing your love to us. We thank you that we are saved. We thank you that we can be in a right relationship with you because of your death and resurrection on the cross. And we pray, Lord, that we will take that and use that as a, a driving motivation and force to show that love to other people. Show us, Lord, who we need to do that for. Bring to mind those people. Give us the, the mechanisms in order to show that love. Give us the opportunities. Help us to love them like you loved us. And Lord, we praise you for this. Help us to live for the then and not for the now. For great is our reward in heaven. We give this to you in your name. Amen.